So where was the type confusion in this code? Well, to see that, we're going to have to go to the code. So it gave you the hint that basically we should start at the IO read function. And I also gave you three control flow paths that would get you to the relevant functions that have to do with the type confusion occurring. So if we follow through those control flow paths, the first place we would have had to go is IO import IOVec. This was the path to the first function that you needed to look at which was IORW buffer select. So that's one of the places there's a problem. So we go into IO import IOVec, then we go through the code. And you know, at this point, the request RW length, what is that? Well, that's going to be the overall buffer group length. And if you don't believe me, well, you can just go to the definition, you can find all references to this, you would find the IO prep RW, which I also gave you as a hint. And basically, this is just to prove to yourself that values that the attacker controls in the submission queue entry, these are all fully attacker controlled values, adder comes from the submission queue entry and goes into this request, which is an IOK IOCB. So attacker control value into adder, attacker control value into length. That was the length of an individual buffer, not the overall buffer group. And this field called buff index, which we know is actually also unioned with the buffer group. So this is actually the buffer group ID being put into the request field named buff index. So all attacker controlled values coming in, but submission queue entry length, this is the smaller individual buffer size. So then we, you know, have opcode again, fully attacker controlled. And because I gave you the hint on the control flow path, you should know that we're not interested in this case here, but instead we're interested in this case there, which you can also see has to require this uh, flag that we said is the optional flag when you're actually using this opportunity for the kernel to select the buffers itself from amongst the buffer group. So we go down this path, IORW buffer select, go in there, and sorry, go back for a second. Submission queue entry length, again, that was the smaller length of the sizes. So we've got length coming in here, we've got the request. And so what happens in this function? The first thing is that we have the request, and we said that request RW adder is a fully attacker controlled user space base address for the overall buffer group. So that is passed in to kbuff. So kbuff is supposed to be an IO buffer pointer. And so these types sort of don't make sense here for a second. So we said that these IO buffer uh, struct pointers, basically there's going to be one of these for each element that is, that is the sliced up array in user space, the sli sliced up buffer group in user space. There's going to be one of these that points at each of those in user space. Well, what this is really doing is it's just grabbing the base address of the buffer group, sticking into this variable, and then it's going to pass that variable into IO buffer select. So really all this was was a little bit of, you know, confusing, uh, choosing not to create another local variable and just reusing it throughout. Okay, so this is just base address of the buffer group put into that local variable. Then we have the buffer group index put into the buffer group in ID field. And then those are passed into IO buffer select. And what happens down this path? So in this path, using that buffer group ID and the kbuff, well, the buffer group ID is used right here in the XA load. And so what is XA load? Let's go to the definition. We see a bunch of XA functions and we can see that it has something to do with something called an X array. At this point, you would basically go Google what is an X array in Linux, and you'd find that it's some sort of extensible array. And then if you go back to this code and you see a whole bunch of list operations, list empty, list last entry, list delete, you might imagine that this extensible array is implemented as a linked list. So basically, they've got a linked list of things that are IO buffer, and uh, these struct IO buffer things. So we've got the head is going to be a pointer to a struct IO buffer. And so it's pulling out based on the group ID. It's going to pull out the head of the list. It's going to check that it's not null. If the list is not empty, then it goes and it grabs the last entry of the list starting from that head. And then that's going to be the K buff that it is selected. So again, K buff is one of these IO buffer pointers. So it pulled out a pointer to an IO buffer. It's then going to delete it out of the list. And then it's going to come down here and check if the length that's stored inside of that K buff is less than the overall length of the length that's actually passed in. 
then we actually want to take this length and we want to cut it down and say, nope, we don't want the length to be any bigger than this buffer actually is. So it's going to decrease the size of that to be appropriate for the individual buffer. And then that's pretty much it. Unlock and return back the K buff, which is that IO buffer pointer. So again, the IO buffer is pointing at its holding information about the user space buffer. So now we've got a K buff. This holds the kernel side metadata about some particular uh, individual buffer out of the buffer group. And then here, you know, there's error checks, but right here, this is the line where things start to get weird. So we've got a K buff, and that is a struct IO buffer pointer, but we're assigning that into this request RW adder. So we saw when it came in, the request RW adder is usually supposed to be the base of the buffer group. And now all of a sudden, we're going to change out that user space pointer with a kernel pointer for some kernel metadata kbuff type struct for an individual buffer instead of the base of all the buffers. So this is weird, and this is what's ultimately going to lead to the type confusion. You know, I can speculate about, you know, why the developers did this, you know, personally in the code I've written, I've certainly had times where I said, okay, well, we don't need this field anymore, so let's just go ahead and reuse it so we don't have to, you know, define an additional field or pass something through some other way. And I think that's probably what happened here is basically they said, okay, we are safe to now just go ahead and put that back into there because we're not going to use that base of the, uh, the buffer group anymore. Regardless, this confusion between a kernel pointer and what is supposed to be a user space pointer is going to end up causing a problem later on. All right, so then they set the flags, this rec f buffer selected. So the select field without the ed was the flag that was being used to indicate that we were using this you know buffer group selection elsewhere but the selected is going to be used elsewhere basically saying okay we've selected some particular buffer out of here finally last thing this does is it hands back the address of the user space so in the kbuff the address is that user space pointer and that's you recall i said in the slides we've got a bunch of buffers sliced up big buffer group and user space and these struct IO buffers are meant to point at an individual entry in user space. Okay, so it's pulling out the individual user space address and it's going to return that back to the function that called this. So let's go back. We came, went into IO RW buffer select. Let's go back to wherever it was called from right here. Okay, so this buff that's coming back is the user space address that indicates the you know base of the, the individual buffer in user space. The SQE lang also got filled in while we were inside of there. It got filled in either it you know had kept the value that it already had, which was this you know individual uh, value that got sent in the attacker controlled value, or if the attacker controlled value was bigger than the actual buffer value, then it got inside of here. Uh, it got filled in with the appropriate size for the actual buffer that um, was set at slicing up the buffer group time. So at this point, it's basically just going to say, okay, the actual real buffer length is this, and so let's go ahead and put that back in and potentially clobber whatever the attacker controlled value is. Now, at this point, I'm just going to return back out of this function because I've shown you the function that was the hint. Although I will say we are going to be coming back to this to understand what's going elsewhere. So I could go into that right now, but you know, if you were just following exactly the hints through the code, you would just be like, okay, well, that's doing whatever it is. And then maybe you'd go back and read the second hinted thing and the third hinted thing. So we've got a user space buffer came back and you know, that buffer is passed in here. We don't know right now what it's done with, what's done with it, but whatever, let's go look for those more hints. So we return back out, we're now in IO read, and then we're going to move down a ways and find the path to the second hint. So our second hint in function is loop RW iter, and we can reach that via this. So let's go into do iter do read. And at this point, we'd say, okay, well, we've got the rec, we've got what's this iter. Okay, the iter comes from, okay, well, it's used there, it's used there, it's used here. Okay, it could have been done here, but we didn't actually take this path, so that's not where it was set. So that means we must be setting it either here or here. So that is basically the point at which we have to backtrack, and we got to say, okay, well, you know, how is this iter defined? Where is it set? So there's a struct iter here on the stack, and it's called underscore underscore iter. 
and then the iter pointer is just the address of that. So iter pointer points to this local variable on the stack, uninitialized, so that could, should cause your sploity sense to tingle. Got this other big array of stuff, of structs on the uh, stack, also appropriate to uh, be concerned about when it comes to uninitialized data access vulnerabilities, but that's not the section we're in, we're in type confusion. So let's go back and figure out where this iter gets filled in. So we go back in here, and we are looking for the use of that iterator. And we know that we didn't go down this control flow path, we know that we went down this control flow path, and so it looks like iter is used here. Also this iovec is used there, and that wasn't used anywhere else, so probably these two things are getting initialized here. So we go into import single range, and unfortunately at this point Eclipse fails to find the definition. So how do I deal with that? I grep the entire thing. I just hit Option Command G, or you could do the search, file search, find all instances of it. And then you look for something that looks like a actual definition. So let the search complete and expand it out. Go down here, search around, and there's something that looks like an actual definition. Okay, so import single IO range. Well, the buff that's passed in was actually the user space address buffer that we had found via that uh, X array lookup. So we've got the user space buffer address, we've got the user space buffer length, we've got a uninitialized IOV, and we've got an uninitialized IOV iter. So IOV is used right here, and it's basically saying, you know what, I'm just gonna set the base to the buff. Well, that's our user space address, and I'm going to set the IOV length to the length which is just the buffer length. Cool, so that fills in the IOV, and again, this was just something that was hitherto uninitialized uh, on the stack, a couple of functions up, but now down here we've actually filled it in and initialized these two values at least. Now let's look at the definition, is that everything? Yep, that looks like that's everything in that structure. And then next, that IOV is going to be passed into the IOV iter in it, and that I is also passed in there, that's the actual iterator itself. We've got this RW, which is just some int, I'm gonna tell you that's the whether it's a read or a write. And so we go into this and we can see that all it is is a big uh, structure initialization. So the I, which is the iterator, is going to have its iter type field set to iter iovect. That's going to be important later on when we look at the control flow to figure out like, well, what type of iterator is this? Because it's going to use it later. So type is iter iovect. Data source is the direction, which was that read or write. IOV, which we just initialized in the function above this, is going to be set to this IOV field here. So if you see any use of the IOVECT uh, IOV field, it was just that base and length, which is the user space base and length. And then there's, you know, some things like the offset that's set to zero, and the count is set to the overall length of the buffer, so whatever it was. Let's say it was a hex 100 bytes or something like that. Okay, so at this point, the iterator has actually been initialized. The iterator is initialized so that it points at this IOV, which is initialized here. The IOV was sitting on the uh, on the stack a couple of functions up, so now these things are all kind of filled in. So we're going to go back. No, we're not going to print. We're going to go back, and uh, we're going to see, okay, this thing is the thing that actually initialized the iterator. It initialized the IOVEC. It actually destroys the pointer right after, but that's fine because this IOVEC came from the function above, and it has basically filled in, you know, one of the zeroth entry here, essentially. Okay, so now we have an actual iterator. We know that it's got an IOVEC pointer inside of it, or a field inside of it, that's going to be pointing at uh, the zeroth entry of here, and that the zeroth entry is just going to have the base and length of the user space buffer. So now we can go down this path. We've got a rec and an iter, and we have a sense of what's inside of that iter. Go down here. Now at this point, we've got some function pointer usage, and you might not you know, be able to automatically, intrinsically figure out which path you should take. That's again why I gave you those control flow path hints. We're trying to make our way to loop RW iter, and the only way to get there is to get down in here. So what this is really doing is it has a notion of the particular file that it's operating on. It may have some function pointers that allow it to iterate natively. So there may be a function pointer that says for this particular file type, here's how you iterate. But if it doesn't have that kind of function pointer, then instead it says, okay, well, let's at least make sure it has a read function pointer. And if it does, okay, here's, we're going to iterate by doing this manually, like looping multiple times. 
and that's what the uh, comment tells you. It says, for files that don't have a read iterator uh, or a write iterator, handle them by looping over read or write manually. Cool, so here we are, we're in a function. This RW again is now set hard-coded to read. So, and uh, if we go to the actual definition, we can see it's a very simple definition. Reads are zeros, writes are ones. That's the same sort of uh, thing that was actually used inside of that iterator uh, initialization. Okay, so we go into here. This is one of the functions that I said we are interested in. So let's take a careful look at this. So inside of this function, it's telling us some stuff about, you know, okay, we don't want to support pulled IO, that's fine. Then we're going to do while IOV iter count on this iterator we just passed in. What does that do? Okay, that returns the count. We know the count was set to the length of the little sliced up buffer. We'll say it's hex 100. Okay, so while this is non-zero, while it hasn't been decremented down to zero, we're going to keep looping through this. Now, you initially run into this right here. It says, if not, iter is bvec. And that's where I said that the iterator type that occurred a few functions ago was important. You can see we've got a bunch of different functions that are all just checking one particular type. Our iterator was initialized to iter iovec type. It is not bvec. So therefore, is not bvec is going to be true, which means we are going to go into this case. At this point, it's going to go into this function. We take a look at it, and it's actually returning a struct, which, you know, if you've never seen that before, it's... Not particularly common, but apparently this code base likes to do it. Uh, it's returning a struct and, you know, it becomes compiler decides how to handle that. But it's returning a struct where the base is calculated as iter IOV IOV base. Well, that was just the user space base address and plus the offset and the offset was set to zero. You can go double check if you don't believe me, but that was set to zero in that sort of hard-coded initialization function. And so the base that's going to be returned back in this struct is really just going to be the user space base. And the length is going to be the minimum of account and the length minus offset. The length is just going to be the length of the buffer. So this function returns back one of these IOVAC structs and the IOVAC struct is just going to have a base of the user space base and a length of the length of the buffer. Cool. So we've got IOVEC, and now it proceeds to do the read or write. Well, we actually know that this was hard-coded to be a read in the function above this, right? Uh, sorry, write, as in R-I-G-H-T. So read, so we know that it absolutely has to go down the read path at this point. So it's going to call the file operations read. It's going to read from the base address, which is that user space base address, read a certain length, and then it's going to return the number of bytes that are actually read. So cool, it called a read, you know, from the, from the file, and it's returning back the number of bytes read. It read the data into this buffer, starting at that base with that length, and length used for sanity checks. But how many bytes it actually successfully read, of course, always depends on file size. You could ask for hex 100 bytes, but the file is only 20 bytes big, so then it would return 20 instead of hex 100. Now, the actual problem that's going to occur here is coming up. So we've got number of bytes read in, and then we've got some sanity checks that we're not going to care about. The actual problem starts occurring in this little bit of code right here. So when we get down to here, we have, okay, decrement the length. So this length at some point was set to the proper, smaller user space length of the buffer. Okay, so that's fine. We read in 20 bytes, you know, out of hex 100 requested, and then we decrement by 20 bytes, or we read in hex 100 bytes, and then we decrement by hex 100. But the problem occurs right here, because at this point, we have reached the sort of type-confused usage of this RW adder. Under normal circumstances, we said that would be pointing at the base of the buffer group, and we would maybe be moving forward inside of the, the buffer entry, although even that, you know, is a little bit uh, skeptical on the particular case that we're handling here, right? If we're, if we're doing buffer groups, it seems like even if that was... Um, you know, pointing still at the base of the buffer group, this would be a little bit suspect because we would always be moving forward in the zeroth entry, not the, you know, selected thing. But anyways, regardless, with the current code as given, this is actually the kbuff IO, struct IO buffer pointer that we grabbed from the first function of interest, right? So uh, going back quickly, Right, this is where the confusion was happening. We had a kbuff. The kbuff was a struct IO buffer. We said those IO buffers are the kernel side 
metadata that's uh, keeping track of you know the individual information about individual user space entries but because this k buff was assigned to the rw adder that means that now this is a kernel pointer to one of these io buffer structs right so we're in loop rw iter so once we're down here and we take this pointer and we move it forward we were actually moving forward past that data structure and we are now moving to point at something else completely different on the heap and this is going to be a problem when we get to our third function we have now you know incremented this so that this pointer is somewhere else on the heap and where in the heap is it depends on how many bytes were read in so it's sort of a you know semi-attacker controlled movement forward based on you know what file they're reading from what size they're passing but basically they get to more or less choose how far forward they want to move this pointer inside of the heap so that's not good the attacker you know has the capability to point this somewhere random in the heap i feel you know particular bug class that we learned about already coming up here soon but that's pretty much it for this function so it moves this pointer forward and then it's going to actually advance the iterator and that should, you know, decrement the iterator by however many bytes are given. Again, we don't have the actual IO iter advance easily found by Eclipse. So let's go double check that. And because there's too many matches, I'm not going to force you to see through all that. Actually, I am because apparently I didn't bookmark it yet. So let's go find that. Scrolling all the way down and then scrolling all the way up. Here we go. IOV iter. Okay, so size is basically mostly going to be used for decrementing things, but let's see if there's any particular case we care about. Uh, is iter is iovec? Oh yes, our iterator is an iovec. So what's it going to do? It's going to do this. It's going to do that. Size. Okay, the count is going to be decremented and some other stuff that I'm not going to dwell on. So cool. We've now figured out that this thing caused some weird movement forward of a kernel pointer, so that that now points somewhere on the heap that the attacker, you know, has a decent amount of control over. And so then we move down through this code again, and we find the third hint it said that I want you to look at IO put K buff, and that's reachable by a IO uh, K IOCB done. All right, so go on looking for IO K buff. We gotta go down through here, go to here. And what we ultimately have down in here is that it's going to be freeing this K buff, which is actually that pointer that's been moved forward. So, okay, we need to back up a little bit to prove to ourselves that that's actually where that's coming from. All right, so I just missed that. So passed in here is the K IOCB, and that is actually a field that comes out of the rec. So that is from the rec itself, and it's a subfield there. So we go into KIOCB done. We follow that KIOCB, and we're right, let's see, where is it? Rec, 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 right here in the first usage. And it's using the container of, and it's calling that on KIOCB, and it's saying, okay, well, this is contained in a IO KIOCB structure. And therefore, you know, what is the actual enclosing structure's pointer? And it's using that for rec. So I don't know why they didn't just pass rec, but instead they, you know, pulled out, they pulled out a subfield and then they looked up the enclosing structure based on the subfield. Okay, so now we've got rec again. Rec is going to be passed into IO put RW K buff. And then right here we have rec RW adder. And this is the value that the attacker has successfully moved forward a you know however many bytes they read that's how far it was moved forward in the heap and so now this is pointing somewhere you know semi attacker controlled that's the k buff k buff is passed into io put k buff and ultimately that k buff is used for a k free so what this means is we have a semi attacker controlled k free and that can lead to a typical use after free situation right it's like an acid free see so yeah, then from here it basically becomes a typical use after free type game to turn the confusion into use after free, free some data structure, have some other code elsewhere, reuse that data structure after data has been allocated in its place. So what was the fix for this? Well, the fix is to make sure that if this RW adder is actually holding that uh, kernel pointer, you don't actually advance it. So 
We said that we know that our iterator was set to that IOVec type. It was not to this. So basically in the case where you're using these uh, this buffer group, that will always go down this case, right? Earlier it went down this case, and then now here later we're also going to go down this case. And so we will move the iterator forward with this function, but we will not move this forward because this is now holding a pointer to that struct IO buffer. Now, I'd also point out an interesting uh, comment that was found uh, in the write-up for this. So the vulnerability was found by a code reading audit looking into a past IO U-ring bug. So she was looking specifically to you know, see how a previous one worked and then look for anything new. So the relevant portion right here is this bit that you know she put as emphasized bold in the original. She said, using the same field for user and kernel pointers seems dangerous. Are there any spots where the rec f buffer select case was forgotten and the two types of pointer were confused? So she recognized that you know this uh, rec rw adder had a kernel address placed into it uh, instead of the user space address, and that seemed like that could lead to confusion. And so she said, okay, well, then I looked for places where, you know, maybe a fully attacker-controlled value could be used to, to achieve a, a, a kernel write, not to trick the kernel into writing to a fully attacker-controlled value, but she didn't have luck finding that. But then she ultimately found uh, this, you know, what she called a lesser severity confusion, but, you know, she went on to make a full root shell exploit for this, so it's, uh, it's not lesser severity if you still get full code execution. So I just point this out to say, you know, this was clearly an example where a researcher was telling you, the reader, that their exploity sense was tingling when they were reading some particular code. And so this was a good example of saying, okay, well, the, the type confusion here was the confusion between, you know, user space and kernel pointers, the reuse of some particular field for completely different usages, possibly out of, you know, just laziness, not wanting to make, you know, extra functions, possibly, you know, just getting confused because the code is very complicated and thinking that it would be, you know, safe everywhere forevermore. But, yep, this was uh, another good example of seeing someone's splitty sense tingle in their write-up.